Hello everybody and welcome back to the SCG Tour here in Atlanta for the Standard Open. I'm Chris Van Meter here with Andrew Boswell and we're getting ready to bring you action for round 13 and 15 and it's going to be exciting. We have Jerry Thompson sitting on top of the pack who's currently 12 and 0. He's planning on not losing this entire tournament. He's just going to keep winning. And we've got a bunch of players who are in the X2 range that are battling for position to try and draw into the top eight. Yeah, it should be pretty exciting. Jerry Thompson has to be in the top eight, and it's going to be exciting to see who's going to make those other slots. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at our players to watch before we jump down to our feature match. Jerry Thompson's at 12 and 0. Dan Jessup is in second place at 10, 1 and 1. Tom Ross, 10 and 2. Cedric Phillips, 10 and 2. Emma Handy, 10 and 2. Awesome, awesome, fabulous players. Ross Merriam also 10 and 2. Then we have Andrew Jessup, Noah Walker, Logan Mize, and Chi Hoi Yim all sitting at 9, 2 and 1. It's pretty phenomenal that we have so many people on our players to watch that are all just killing it in this tournament. Joshua Dickerson's fallen to 9 and 3 with that Ooh, mono blue deck. I wonder what happened. Hopefully he can keep winning. Todd Stevens, Andy Ferguson, Jeff Hoagland all at 9 and 3, and then Jim Davis has fallen down to 8 and 4. All in all, a pretty solid showing from like the name brand players. I really wanted to see that uh, mono blue control deck in top 8, but. 9-3 is still good, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping he rattles off another two wins. Still fingers crossed to see yeah. if he can find his way into the top eight. But for this round, we're going to see Tom Ross, who is on his white-red aggro deck, playing against Austin Matthews on his Bant rights deck that we saw earlier in the day uh, take a, 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 a sad loss. But Tom has just been killing it. Let's go ahead and jump down to the feature match area where the players are waiting for us so we can get them underway and see just how this match happens to play out. So as you would expect, Tom Ross is just doing his Tom Ross thing. He's going to bring the beats fast and hard, this white humans deck. It's, it's mostly white. It just has a few red lands and one red card in, or one or two red cards on the sideboard. Uh, it's predominantly a mono white deck, and he's just going to pummel Austin as fast as he can. Austin is going to be trying to use Collected Company and Reflector Mage to catch up on tempo and then dominate the game with more powerful cards later on. Well, Austin's going to start off with an Evolving Wilds, getting a basic island. Tom is just going to start off with a Town Gossip Monger off of a Plains, and he's going to get that beat down going early. His deck does only have 18 land in the main deck, and he's trying to end this game very quickly. Yeah, one thing to note about this Bant Rights deck is that it doesn't have an infinite combo like a lot of the previous Rights decks that we've seen. So Austin's going to be looking to just gum up the board and put a lot of stuff into play. And he does have some flyers uh, in those Eldrazi Sky Spawners. He can use Reflector Mage and uh, Eldrazi Displacer to you know, control his opponent's board. And then Reality Smasher just, does just that, smashes all of the realities of his opponent, thinking that they're going to win the game. Austin has a Duskwatch Recruiter on turn two. Tom is just going to add a uh, Consul's Lieutenant to the battlefield. On turn three, Austin is going to use a Reflector Mage to bounce that Consul's Lieutenant back to Tom's hand, but he is going to use it to transform his Town Gossip Monger into an Incited Rabble. And now the race is on. Austin's going to crash in for two with the Duskwatch Recruiter, going to drop, drop Tom down to 18 life. A little unusual to see Austin do first blood, but Tom is going to make up for lost time real fast. Well, Austin was on the play, and that plays, plays a big part into that. Yep. This right deck does have a lot of two drops that it can use. Ooh, and Griffspoon is one of the great cards that Tom has access to. When this board gets clogged up, Griffspoon is going to give him a way to take to the skies and potentially finish off Austin Matthews. This deck doesn't have any burn, but Griffspoon sort of serves as a form of reach. Yeah, it's going to give that inside of Rabble plus one, plus zero, and flying. He's going to crash in for three, knocking Austin down to 17, and play a Dragon Hunter and pass the turn. Let's see if Austin has another Reflector Mage to take care oh. of that inside of Rabble. He does. That's, that's going gross. to that's going to put the Griff's Boon into his graveyard, but you can pay some mana uh, and put that back onto a creature uh, later on in the game. Yeah, and Tom is having to play a little de bit of defense here. He's falling behind on the board, and he knows that he's going to need a lot more time if he's going to actually play out all the cards in his hand. So while he wants to be the aggressor, he's got to play at least a little bit of defense here. Dragon Hunter is going to trade off with the Duskwatch Recruiter. Reflector Mage is going to get in for two points of damage, bringing Tom down, Tom down to 16. Uh, but Tom is stuck on mana. He does only have two lands, and he's not really getting, he's not really able to a point where he can put two threats onto the board. Yeah. So one thing that's going to be a little interesting here is as we get more into the mid game, uh, Tom's creatures are usually pretty close to the size of Austin's. Austin has two big, 
big creatures in the form of Sylvan Advocate and Reality Smasher, but Tom can actually do a pretty good job of trading. And we could see one of these corner case scenarios where the white aggressive deck ends up grinding out its opponent simply because it has this low land count and it can just continually trade. And Austin, without a card like Collected Company or Duskwatch Recruiter, doesn't have any other access to card advantage. Well, Tom is going to miss his third land drop yet again. But Austin passed with five mana available, signaling that he does have a Collected Company that's going to happen here on Tom's end step. And if he happens to hit something like uh, Eldrazi Displacer or another Reflector Mage, this could end up real bad for Tom. Yeah, absolutely. And just generally speaking, you know, as an aggro deck, whenever you're on the draw and your opponent gets to play two Reflector Mages and a Collected Company, you're going to be having a, a hard time winning that game. Well, Tom is able to amass a board here with a Town, town Gossip Monger and a Thraben Inspector to go along with his Consul's Lieutenant, but that Collected Company is going to hit a Duskwatch Recruiter and a Sylvan Advocate for Austin Matthews, and all of a sudden his board looks massive. If he has a six land, a Sylvan Advocate's going to be even bigger. Yeah, not only would a six land make the Sylvan Advocate bigger, but it also allow for two Duskwatch Recruiter activations, so Austin can kind of pick and choose how he wants to play this game. He can go long or he can go fast. Well, he does have a six land and it's a Westvale Abbey. Two Reflector Mages and that Sylvan Advocate that's now 4-5 is going to come into the red zone. Let's see how Tom decides he wants to do some blocks here. He has a 1-1, one, one, a 1-2, one, and a 2-1 first strike. So one thing that's a little interesting is, I'm not 100% sure, but I think Tom actually has a Declaration of Stone in hand. And he could have played that on either last turn or the turn before, getting both Reflector Mages. And I really like the way that he's holding his removal spell until the last possible moment, especially because the Declaration in Stone is going to be able to give his opponent clues that he can cash in for new cards. So I like how Sa Tom is following the paradigm of play your creatures first and your spells afterwards. It looks like Tom is just not going to block at all. He's going to take eight points of damage and fall to two. Austin's going to play an Eldrazi Sky Spawner past the turn and leave three mana up to utilize his Duskwatch Recruiter uh, on Tom's end step. Tom did find a third land here, so let's see if he's able to amass a board that can stop this onslaught of attacks from Austin. Yeah, Tom has a lot of work to do. Austin's deck was just firing on all cylinders. He was on the play. Tom being on the draw and missing land drops is not really where he wants to be. One of the things that can help him when he is on the draw is the fact that he's Knight of the White Orchid to kind of ramp his mana. Unfortunately, he didn't have that tempo boost, and Austin, with his two Reflector Mages, put himself way far ahead. So it looks like we're going to have Declaration in Stone. It's going to take care of the two Reflector Mages for Austin. It is going to give him two clues, though. Tom's going to play his third land and likely just play another creature. He's going to be on defense duty here, though. Oh, he has that another Griff's Boon. This is going to give him some defense against those flying attackers from Austin. Yeah, and it's a little nice, too, because of the fact that it's now a three-power first striker. It can profitably block almost all of Austin's creatures, everything except for the Sylvan Advocate. The Duskwatch Recruiter activation is going to find another copy of Eldrazi Sky Spawner for Austin. And we might just be in a situation here where he just starts attacking um, with all of his creatures and getting in as much damage as he can to close the game out. He also is in a spot where he could, uh, you know, make some more creatures and then transform that Westfile Abbey into an Ormondal. And that will, you know, basically put the game away if Tom doesn't have another copy of Declaration in Stone. One thing that's a little interesting here is normally giving your opponent those clues from Declaration of Stone is a pretty big deal. In this particular case, since this Duskwatch Recruiter is uncontested, Austin is able to sink his mana to draw new cards anyway, and the, the clues may just sit there for a while since Austin would rather activate the Duskwatch Recruiter and be more likely to hit a live creature rather than a potentially dead card like a land with the clue. Well, that Recruiter activation is going to find a copy of an Eldrazi Displacer for Austin. They can use that to tap down some blockers for Tom, but he also can just use that to get rid of the Griff's Boon and free up his flying attackers. Yeah, that Eldrazi Displacer is going to be a pretty big problem, not on this turn, but on the following turn for sure. So Tom's or Austin's going to go ahead and attack with his Sky Spawner, his... Duskwatch Recruiter and that Sylvan Advocate at the end. Town Gossip Monger is going to transform into a Incited Rabble and take care of the Duskwatch Recruiter. He's also going to just chump off that Sylvan Advocate. 
Let's see what Austin has now. And you can see that Tom's uh, mechanics are just spot on. He does his blocks, he passes priority, he taps on his first striker to say first strike damage happens, and then after all that, then he transforms his incited rabble. So this Eldrazi Displacer, Displacer is going to threaten tapping down all of Tom's blockers uh, unless he can produce some more so that he can end the game next turn. Let's see what Tom is able to develop on his board. Looks yeah. like he does have another Declaration in Stone, which, which can take care of that Eldrazi Displacer, though. One of the things that's tricky about this is Austin has generated so much card advantage that this is almost like a boxing match where you know your opponent is tired and you can just lean on them and you just keep leaning and eventually they break. And with Tom being behind on lands, behind on the board, behind on life total, and also behind on cards, Austin is, is going to be able to just do that and continually lean on Tom until he breaks. Well, Declaration in Stone is going to take care of that Eldrazi Displacer. Inside a Rabble does have to attack. Sylvan Advocate's going to jump in front of it and eat it. And now Austin's going to go to his next turn. That Sylvan Advocate is just relentless in attacking. A 4-5 is so big on this board right now. And I'm a little surprised that Tom didn't attack with his Consul's Lieutenant. I assume that the plan is to just chump block the Sylvan Advocate with his Kithion. And I don't think Tom has the ability to play around much. So I think it would have been a got good opportunity to just get a... Uh, a renown trigger on that consul's lieutenant. This plays around reflector mage better, but I, I don't think you can play around reflector mage. Especially since Austin's already used to, and yeah. even if we don't attack, reflector mage is gonna be busto here at this point. Right. We also have this boom. Yeah. Reality and Austin smasher. Plays reality smasher comes in for a swing. Tom's gonna have to scoop him up. That is game, and we are onto the sideboard. Austin Matthews is gonna take this. First game from Tom Ross. He is on Bant right at 10 and 2. Tom Ross is also on White Red Humans at 10 and 2. Let's take a look at the players' sideboards and see how we think they're going to switch their deck up here for the post board games. Tom has one Griff's Boon, three Handware Militia Captain, four Needle Spires, four Reckless Bushwhacker, a Silk Wrap, and two copies of Stasis Snare. How do we think he's going to side? So he has a couple options here, but honestly, I like for the most part his main deck. I think that the Griff's Boon is a card that he could consider. Uh, bringing in because it's such a good way to push through the board when it gets really clogged. But the the enchantment removal may be something that he wants to look to instead so that he can answer those uh, reality smashers and the Eldrazi displacers. On Austin's side, we have three Matter Reshaper, a reality smasher, two Dramokas Command, three Thought Not Seer, three Negate, and three Declaration in Stone. What do we think he's going to sideboard? So I like... Bringing in the Mattery Shapers, they're a great blocker. I also like bringing in the Dramokas Commands because it can be so good against Tom. He's got a lot of small creatures and some enchantments. And then the other card I think that uh, can be good is Thought Not Seer. It's just a pretty decent sized body. And if you exile one of Tom's few interactive spells, you can put yourself in a really good situation to clog the board. Well, I definitely agree with all of that. Now, Tom Ross lives in Roanoke with the rest of the Roanoke crew. And coming up here at the StarCityGames.com Game Center very soon is going to be the Eldritch Moon pre-release. Oh, nice. Where you're going to be able to get these limited edition playmats. Now, it used to be that you could only get them in Roanoke at the Game Center or the following Monday when the remaining playmats were put on sale for a limited time on the website. But now these are available at participating stores just by going to go.StarCityGames.com slash pre-release and having your store sign up with Star City to get these playmats. July 16th and 17th is the pre-release, and you can get this limited edition Eldritch Groove playmat <laughs> with Lily Llama Vest and her dancing snakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love these things. They're just sweet, they're cool, and uh, you know, I was kind of planning on getting the Roanoke Center at some point for a pre-release because I wanted one of these, but now I don't have to go that far. Now you don't. You just have your local game store get set up to have them there in the shop for your local pre-release. Go.StarCityGames.com slash pre-release for more details. Now as the players are starting to finish up sideboarding here, let's learn a little bit more about Tom the Boss Ross. I know you love him. I love him. We oh, all yeah. love him. Leather jacket, aggro decks, really uh, gives people the business before they're ready for it. It's my style. Tom is 32. He lives in Roanoke, Virginia. 
He has 11 open top eights, two open wins, three invitational top eights, two invitational wins. That is quite a resume. He is also a Mortal Kombat X enthusiast specializing in Molina. He is a five-time Louisiana State Champion in Magic, and apparently used to do parkour, and he can still do backflips. I kind of want to ask him to do a backflip. So I think all of this is awesome, but I want to call shenanigans on the Molina. Molina should have been banned. That character was so unfair in, in uh, Mortal Kombat X. Do you play that? I do not. Yeah, she's just like way too good. Why is she too good? She has this like stupid like jump up and like teleport sideways across the screen like jump punch, and it's so fast it counters your opponent anytime they try to do any kind of jump, and it's a great way of dodging attacks and just like closing the distance. It's like really good. So you're trying to tell me that Tom Ross has chosen to play the most busted character in that game? Yeah and now he's on White Red Humans. Should everybody just be playing White Red Humans? He usually usually finds just like one of the most busted things to do in whatever format he's playing in. I, I do like this deck a lot. It, <laughs> it, it certainly gets the boss seal of approval. What? I'm still on that, that white green tokens train, but oh. if I wasn't, uh, this, this deck would, wanna be my would be one of my next choices. What, what if his deck had Dramoka's command in it? Would you be more likely to play it then? Okay, hold on, hold on. we just need to time out here. Jerry Thompson just walked by. Tom Ross is playing one of the most aggressive decks. Fast player, goes through fast games. And Jerry Thompson has won his match before we're even done with Tom's, like, game two. Well, I mean, when you go on to be 13-0, and 0, you usually just beat your opponents really quick. Is it one of those things where the, the, the winning just keeps getting easier for yeah, Jerry? Is that how it goes? All downhill from here. Ain't no breaks on this crazy train. All right, game two is going to get started off here. Tom Ross is going to take a point of damage, go down to 19. He's going to deploy a town gossip monger. Austin just has a enter the battlefield tapped land with Canopy Vista. So let's see if Tom can deploy one or two more creatures this turn and put up an assault starting on turn three. So I think when we look at each player's average draw, Tom is going to be coming out a little ahead uh, for the most part. but. The things that can really swing things on Austin's side of the board are cards like Reflector Mage and Collected Company. I think for the most part, those are the cards that Austin wants to draw. If he doesn't see those cards, he's likely to get run over. But if he sees enough of those cards, he's likely to just clog things up and win the long game. Well, Tom is just going to play another Gossip Monger and then a copy of Griff's Boon on the initial Gossip Monger. On, his, on Austin's end step, he's going to transform it into an incited rabble after Austin adds a Sylvan Advocate to his board. And here we're going to see Tom is going to get the beatdown started very quickly with an evasive threat, but it is vulnerable to Reflector Mage. The nice thing, though, is if incited rabble does get hit with Reflector Ooh. Mage, if incited rabble does get hit with Reflector Mage, you can still just replay it as a town gossip monger because they have different names. This always watching is pretty backbreaking, though. Tom's going to take a point of damage to cast it but he can attack with both of his creatures. Before damage, he can use one, he can use the Incited Rabble to transform the Town Gossip Monger, Town Gossip Monger into an Incited Rabble and do a boatload of damage. Yeah, this is a lot. Austin has no, no good blocks. He's just gonna have to take the seven damage. And Tom I already has him on a two turn clock. So seven is gonna knock Austin down to 13. He did just pick up a copy of Reflector Mage though. So that is gonna help quite a bit. He will need an untapped blue source to be able to play it this turn, though. Yeah, this is the sort of situation, though, where Tom has already established a turn five kill just with his uh, first three turns worth of plays. So now not only does Austin have to answer what's on the board, he needs to answer whatever's going to end up replacing it, too. Otherwise, Tom is likely going to keep that uh, same clock in effect. Just going to continue to apply pressure, yep. and eventually Austin will have to succumb to it. Yeah. Looks like he just has another copy of Sylvan Advocate. Ooh. Oh, and an Evolving Wilds is his third land, so Tom is going to get another attack in. <laughs> Austin goes for the attack. Might as well, but yeah. it's a little paltry compared to Tom's. Austin is going to crash in for two with his Sylvan Advocate, bringing Tom down to 15. Let's see if Tom can add some more damage to the board here. And imagine he had something like a Thalia's Lieutenant here. Ooh, that would be nice. Now that Incited Rebel is going to have to attack, uh, and it's a 3-4, so those Sylvan Advocates could potentially jump in front of it and trade trade one for one. Well, I believe that with the pumps. Oh no, never mind. He can make it five. Yeah, he can only make it five. So Austin can run the double block and 
trade one of his Sylvan Advocates for an Incited Rabble, which I have to imagine is going to be in his favor, and he does choose to do it. So at least he gets one of them off the board, but he's got to be worried about what Tom's going to do next. Tom is firing on all cylinders. Looks like we've just got a Knight of the White Orchid and a Thraben Inspector. It's going to bring a clue along. He's going to pass the turn. Austin's going to use his Evolving Wilds on Tom's end step. After falling to nine on the combat, he's going to fly to Basic Island. This is going to allow him to deploy a Reflector Mage, but that Knight of the White Orchid being a 3-3 first strike means that he's going to have, Tom's going to have some awesome attacks next turn. Yeah, for sure. And even without the Thraben Inspector, just the Incited Rabble and the Knight of the White Orchid are threatening lethal. So it's really on Austin to make some big plays here, whether the Reflector Mages or Collect Company or two spells in one turn. He's got to do something pretty serious to catch up here. One play that would be really nice is, I believe he has a Jamoka's Command. He could actually have Tom sack an enchantment and have the Sylvan Advocate fight the 3-3 three, three Knight of the White Orchid. And because of the way Jamoka's Command reads, Jamoka's Command says that you sacrifice the enchantment first, but Tom could sacrifice the Griff Spoon instead, which would kind of be a not let that play work out. So a pretty complicated scenario, and we'll have to see what Austin decides to do. Right, well here we're going to have a Reflector Mage from Austin. It is going to target that Incited Rabble. It will go back to Tom's hand as the Town Gossip Monger. Griff's Boon is going to go to the graveyard. And this is a great way to set up that Dramoka's Command for the following turn, because now that Griff's Boon is potentially out of the question. Tom may just decide to recast it from his graveyard, but that would be kind of an inefficient use of his mana. Tom is just going to go ahead and attack with a Knight of the White Orchid. Let's see what Austin decides to do. He doesn't really have any good blocks. He's just going to take three, go down to six. Which is a pretty scary proposition, because that Griff Spoon, he knows, can kill him if his life total gets too low and he taps out at the wrong moment. Tom has another Knight of the White Orchid and that Town Gossip Monger to redeploy to the battlefield. And Austin stumbling a little bit on mana here, being on the draw. Uh, we really get to see how Tom's deck is firing on all cylinders and just taking advantage of this situation perfectly. The Dramokas Command is still a pretty good play, but Austin really needs to do multiple things on his turn. The Dramokas Command kind of serves as a two spells at once but he would really not like to cast another spell also. Looks like he does only have one land though, so he will be able to use this Tremokas command to take care of the always watching and get rid of one of those Knight of the White Orchids, but that Griff Spoon is gonna be able to try and punch the last few points of damage through here. And it looks like he's going after the uh, Incited Drabble simply because it can be pumped to have more power. If Tom doesn't draw another always watch, it, ooh, that's good. Basically, and always watching. We've got yeah. a Thalia's Lieutenant. He's going to pump all of his humans. This is the, uh, the always watching that leaves the Thalia's Lieutenant behind. Pretty good. He's basically just going to be able to attack with all of his creatures here if he wants. Yeah, and Austin's going to have to run at least one Trump block on one of those Knight of the White Orchids, and then can block the three open Inspector, but that'll put Austin to three. And that Griff Spoon is looking like it's going to be finishing this game up on the next turn, unless Austin has something real good. Tom even has mana open here to cash in that clue on Austin's end step. Yeah. And this is showcasing exactly why you would want to play this white-red humans deck. This is just beating hard and fast, curving out, getting a ton of board pressure, a lot of power and toughness. This is just the, the, the boss raw style. Yeah, it's just been, ever since the early stages of this game, Tom has just had Austin on the back foot and it's just been dictating all of the plays that Austin has available. Yeah. Reflector Mage is going to chump a Knight of the White Orchid. Sylvan Advocate is going to step in front of the Thraben Inspector. Austin will take three down to three. Tom's going to cash in that clue, pass the turn back. And it looks like the, the writing is all but on the wall at this point, but let's see what Austin decides he wants to do. I believe that he can play an Eldrazi Sky Spawner, which can do a little bit to keep him alive. If he was hitting land drops, and it looks like he is, there may be some hope if he can buy enough time to have some sort of big play, but the kind of big play that he needs is a card like Tragic Arrogance that would just you know sweep away a lot of this. And unfortunately, Austin doesn't really have access to that, so he's mostly just biding his time and 
essentially hoping a miracle happens. So Tom is just going to play a Thraben Inspector. Ooh. He's going to cash in his clue. And this gets that Thalys attendant up to a 3-3, so now it is also a lethal attacker. He's going to play an Expedition Envoy. It's going to attack. He has three lethal attackers along with that Thraben Inspector. So Matthews is going to be forced to just chump block all three of those lethal attackers. Yeah, Austin's combat decisions are already made for him, and it's likely that we're going to see a block. Maybe he cracks his fetch land, draws a card for his turn, and is likely just going to scoop them all up. And we're going to be shuffling up for game three in just a moment here. Well, he's going to go ahead and use the fetch. Maybe he has something like Tragic Arrogance, but that still would not be good enough. Mm, I've been to the future. I think he's going to draw his card, shuffle, <laughs> next game. Time travel in Boz. Yep. And he just finds a forest with his Evolving Wilds. He's just going to draw a card. And there we go. It's like I knew what would happen. Jeez, I'm good at this. Well, Tom Ross is going to take game two. He's going to even the series up one to one. We're going to be going into game three here. Tom Ross on white, red humans. Austin Matthews on bent right. Both players are 10 and two. Uh, and this, th a win this round would put them in a very good position to top eight this event. Do we think that either player is going to change their strategies for this game three? I think for the most part, both of them are just going to shuffle up what they got and present and get it going again. Now, Tom Ross is a content producer on StarCityGames.com. Yeah, he's got great content. He does have great content. His videos in the Versus series, his articles are awesome. He's also been known every now and then to write a piece for the newsletter. Oh, yeah? Cool. So you can check out our StarCityGames.com newsletter. It's your source for Magic the Gathering news. You get the latest on the SCG Tour. You can watch the SCG Tour match of the week, receive exclusive deck lists and advice, catch up on all the event results, read an exclusive cardboard crack comic, and you can sign up absolutely free. Go to StarCityGames.com slash newsletter. I believe you've written for it a couple times, too. I have. Have you? Yes, I am. Man, they have great authors, don't they? They do. In fact, for a while, <laughs> for a while, I used to write every other week for the newsletter. Oh, yeah, that's cool. I know right now they also have uh, Craig Kremple's fellow commentator writing for it. Yeah, he's pretty good at Magic. He got second place at the Invitational yeah. in Columbus. Dude, Star City coverage teams done pretty well at tournaments. You know. We got we to get back in the get back in the fray. Oh, I, I, I was in the fray last weekend. And the Open Series fray. Oh, yeah. Well, they keep booking me for like <laughs> events that I want to play in. Rough life. Yeah, rough life. First world problems. So, again, StarCityGames.com newsletter, absolutely free. Go to StarCityGames.com slash newsletter. It's your source for Magic the Gathering news. So we come back to our players here. Tom Ross is at 10-2. Austin Matthews also at 10-2. White Red Humans, Bant Wrights. Who do you think has the edge here with Tom being on the draw? So I think that Tom still has the edge, but it is certainly diminished compared to when he's on the play. I think the defining factor is going to be whether or not Tom stumbles, and usually he won't. These white red human de decks are, are pretty consistent. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to look for is how many reflector mages Austin gets to play. We saw in game one, Austin had like two reflector mages, I think, and a collected company all in a row. And that, combined with the fact that he was on the play, really catapulted him in the game. In game two, Tom was on the play. Austin had another two drop on turn three and then had a reflector mage on turn four. We didn't have any other reflector mages, didn't have any other collected companies, and it was basically a slaughter in Tom's favor. So I would still give the edge to Tom, but the thing that will really swing it is how many reflector mages, how many collected companies appear on Austin's side of the table. Yeah, I feel like that's a very important point, uh, particularly in games where Austin is on the play. I think that when Austin is on the draw, he is such a huge dog to win any of right. these games if both, if both players you know, just happen to have average draws. Yeah. But being on the play, it's close enough to where you know, if Austin has a healthy number of reflector mages and or collected companies, like you said, it does just give him the edge. Yeah. It's a little weird to say, but I would say that Tom is favored but if Austin is able to find two Reflector Mages in the, the top 11 cards of his library, obviously including his opening hand, he's going to be a huge favorite. Man, that card's pretty good, isn't it? In, in these matches, we are just trying to curve out and beat down with medium and small size creatures. Reflector Mage is just a huge roadblock. So one of the things that I like to think about when we see weird stats on cards mm -hmm is to try and figure out where that stat came from. Mm -hmm. So a, a good example of this is Deathrite Shaman was a 1-2. 
Oh yeah. And so uh, I, you know, I've heard some stories that in development uh, it was a one-one, but was changed to a one-two because Lingering Souls was so powerful, there were cards like Is It Staticaster and Electricery coming, but they didn't want the Lingering Souls hate cards yep. to also affect Deathrite Shaman, which seems weird because Deathrite Shaman is just much better than Lingering Souls. Mm -hmm. They just didn't realize it at the time. But Reflector Mage being a 2-3, I, I, I just wonder why. Like yeah. you have these awesome abilities tacked onto it, bouncing a creature like a Mana War, stopping that creature from coming back into play on the next turn. Those are very blue-white flavored abilities. But just being a 2-3 is huge because it's so good against opposing aggro decks. I just wonder why it has that extra point of toughness. You know, I think that's a great question. I think we should tweet at Ian Duke and ask him. <laughs> He's a... Uh, you know, on R&D, he's the kind of person who has answers to those questions. Well, Tweet out a lot of the, like Sam Stoddard, you know, there's, there's a lot of great R&D members who are on Twitter, and if you, if you ask them a question, you'll probably get an answer. So, we're going to start the game off here. Austin Matthews does have a Lumbering Falls, Tom Ross with a Town Gossip Monger. Austin does have a turn two creature, but it is only an Elvish Visionary, so that applies much less pressure and plays much worse defense than something like Sylvan Advocate does. That is absolutely true, but having an Elvish Visionary on turn two is a lot better than having nothing on turn two. So granted, I uh, wouldn't be excited about the play. Um, I'm thankful I have at least it. <laughs> Looks like we've got an, an Envoy Expedition and an Anoiter of Champions for Tom. So we've got one drop and then double one drop. I don't think he's going to attack here. I think he's just going to try and transform his town gossip monger. He's yeah. going to pass the turn back to Austin. I agree. And this is the thing that gets really scary with these aggressive decks. Sometimes you're on the play and you think you're going to be ahead on tempo, but then they get a creature out ahead of you and they're casting two spells a turn before you are and they just like surpass you on tempo. So one thing that is nice about the Elvish Visionary is if you do draw a card like Dromoka's Command, in order for it to be a removal spell, you have to have a creature in play. So having these Elvish Visionaries, uh, they may be more than just Trump Blockers. They might actually trade with a 2-1, which would be pretty phenomenal. And if Austin draws a uh, Dromoka's Command, he needs some sort of body on the board to make full use of it. Well, Austin's going to deploy another Elvish Visionary, play an Evolving Wilds and pass. Tom's just going to transform his Town Gossip Monger into an Incited Rabble. Now he gets to attack with both of his creatures here, and that Anointer of Champions is going to make it so that Austin can't profitably block that Expedition Envoy, and then Tom is going to be able to use mana for the rest of his turn. And Anointer of Champions is a really sweet inclusion in this white-red humans deck. One of the things that you really want in these hyper-aggressive strategies is an extremely high threat density. You usually want a low land count, you want a low spell count, and you want a lot of creatures that you can just proactively play and attack. That said, you can often be vulnerable to not having enough interaction. And in order of Champions is uh, kind of a weak card, but it's good in the sense that it's versatile. It can be a creature or it can be a spell and help you interact inside of combat to push things through. All right, so it looks like Austin is just going to take five on the, on the attack. Tom is going to play a Knight of the White Orchid. Austin's going to sacrifice his Evolving Wilds in response, but rather be, than be tricky and fail to find to deny Tom a land, he is going to get his own basic land of planes. Uh, it looks like he does have another land and a Collected Company in his hand, so next turn could be real important for Austin if he hits some good cards off that Collected Company. Yeah, Austin really hasn't done much on these first couple turns. You can see Tom has an overwhelming board presence, but one good Collected Company could change things, and Austin's going to be hoping that that is exactly what happens. So Tom's going to get some value off that Knight of the White Orchid, getting an extra land. He's going to play a land for his turn and deploy a Kithion Hero of Akros. He has a pretty formidable board here. Something like Always Watching could be really good next turn. Oh, Always Watching. Always Watching would be like deploying a three mana 5-5 five five with haste. <laughs> I, th there's, there's five creatures on the board. That's, that's basically what it would be. That's pretty good. Let's see how awesome decides he wants to navigate this turn. He is pretty far behind. But like you said, a good collected company in the middle of Tom's combat step could spell doom for Tom. The implications of an Anthem effect are, are pretty phenomenal when you look at it too, because not only would a Anthem 
add five power and five toughness onto the board, but to also allow creatures to attack when they otherwise wouldn't be able to, meaning that you're getting even more than that in terms of effective attacking power and toughness. Looks like Austin's going to use a Dramokus command to put a counter on his Elvish Visionary and fight the Anointer of Champions. Then he's going to use a Declaration in Stone to get rid of that Kithion and give Tom a clue. This so this is, is kind of a nice turn because he got to cast two spells at once, but he's still a little behind on the board, but at least he's making some headway to catch up. Yeah, this is going to give him a 2-2 creature and a 1-1 that he can use to play some defense here. So let's see how Tom decides he wants to navigate this turn. Incited Rabble and Knight of the White Orchid are going to come in. Austin wow, is and Matthew goes for the, uh, essentially two for one himself with this block, but he's going to be able to use up two of Tom's mana on this turn, and Austin already got a card out of each of those Elvish Visionaries, so it seems he thinks that this is a, a reasonable trade. He just wants to take less damage, do a little bit of trading, keep the board a little cleaner, and play for a longer game. Let's see how Tom decides he wants to navigate this double block. He can just pump the rabble once and clear out both creatures that Austin has. I forget who it was, but I saw someone playing one of these white aggressive humans decks, and he actually had tandem tactics in his sideboard. And in a matchup like this, where it's a lot of creature-on-creature -creature combat, I have to imagine that uh, like one or two tandem tactics would just be like the spiciest of cards to blow your opponent out. Well, Tom is going to go ahead and pump his Incited Rabble, trade off with those Visionaries. He's going to add a Thraben Inspector to the board, get a second clue, and pass the turn. And now this board looks ripe for a Collected Company from Austin. Yeah, Collected Company into a Reflector Mage would get Austin back onto parity and on the road to uh, taking things over. Well, he is just going to play a Yavamaya Coast and pass the turn. Let's see how Tom decides he wants to navigate this turn. And Tom knows that he has to worry about Collected Company. Uh, there may not be a whole lot he can do about it. He may run headlong into it anyway, but it's certainly on his radar. Tom Ross doesn't miss a thing. Well, it looks like he potentially could have some Stasis Snare that he boarded in. He's going to crack a clue to draw a card. That gives him a land. And so that crack was a little interesting because Tom didn't have a fifth land. So if you cracked that clue and didn't find a land, he would be unable to cast that Stasis Snare. So pretty interesting judgment call to see him do that. C certainly something we could talk about longer if we had time. Well, the Collected Company is going to bring a Matter Reshaper and an Eldrazi Sky Spawner. That's going to add three creatures to the board. Let's see what Austin has now on this turn. Psyche's hand is just full of land, but one of which is a Westvale Abbey that might have some potential later on in the game. Yeah, and this board state is going to get a lot more complicated for Tom. If Matthew decides to pass with mana up again, Tom has to wonder, does he have another Collected Company? Does he have Dromoka's Command? Could he have something like Avacyn? You know, all of these things are going to be tough for Tom to figure out. Wow, and that is bold. That would have me feeling either a little worried if I was Tom, or a little more confident, thinking there's one less attacker, maybe I can get through this turn for some big damage. So Austin's just going to get in for two with that Eldrazi Sky Spawner. Tom's going to crack his clue on Austin's end step, and with his draw for the turn, he's going to pick up two more lands. And the attack with the Eldrazi Sky Spawner, if I was in Tom's shoes, I would assume that means that Austin's hand is quite good, and he has another collected company. So I can certainly understand if Tom wants to just wait another turn and not run into it. But it looks like Austin is just going to be making a token, so maybe he doesn't have the collected company. It looks like he has just lands in his hand. Austin's going to use his Westfell Abbey to make a 1-1 human cleric on Tom's end step. And I'm a little surprised that Austin attacked with the Eldrazi Sky Spawner. I'm not sure if it's because he thought that he just didn't have much time and needed to close the game out quickly, or uh, if he really does feel that confident in this position that he can afford the attack. If Tom had a good follow-up, things could have gone quite poorly for him. So Austin just picked up a copy of Dromoka's Command, and the way this game is turning out, that's going to be huge. Uh, 
how I see this game playing out is Austin is going to transform that Ormondal. And Tom has a Stasis Snare in his hand that he's going to be able to use to snag it. And this Dramoka's Command can free it. And, you know, it'll, it'll come back as a, as a land, but it'll, it'll have a chance to try and transform it again. But it looks like Austin is just going to use this Dramoka's Command wow. now and to try and get And this is great for Tom Ross. So this is essentially a situation with whoever blinked first would lose. Both players have removal spells, and whoever used their one first is going to get blown out by the other. So Austin has chosen his modes on Dramoka's Command, plus one, plus one fight, and Tom is going to be able to just exile the creature that's going to be fighting, which is Mattery Shaper, and is the target that Tom most would want to exile. So now Austin has lost one of his key blockers and a source of card advantage, and Tom has baited out a removal spell and rendered it completely ineffective. So huge play from Tom Ross, certainly a pretty big tempo swim. Austin's going to attack in for two with his Sky Spawner. This is going to allow Tom to get in some attacks this turn. It's like he just picked up another copy of Stasis Snare. So last turn, Tom gave Austin the respect of having Dramoka's command, and Austin ended up doing nothing with his mana when Tom didn't attack except make that 1-1 uh, one, one clear token. So this turn, I would expect Tom to assume that the Dramoka's command is what Austin drew for the turn, and that he, if he didn't have the Dramoka's command, uh, the Collected Company previously, he doesn't have it now. So I'd expect to see Tom make that read and go for a pretty hefty attack here. Looks like he's just going to use the Thraben Inspector, cash in the clue, play a wow, land. Wow, super patient from Tom Ross. And not attack with that, neither the White Orchid. Really patient from Tom Ross. Austin's going to come in for two with his Sky Spawner. I wonder if because of that Eldrazi Sky Spawner attacking, Tom just assumes Austin has collected company and is just saving it for when I go into combat. And Tom is just flooding out here. He's drawn lands after lands after lands. Well, even, even his clues have given him lands. Yeah. With both players flooding out, I ha it, it does favor Austin, but at least there's a little bit of equality in the flood. Yeah, I mean, Tom has a couple one twos and that Knight of the White Orchid. If he can ever find something like an Always Watching or a Thraben or a Thalia's Lieutenant, this board could get real ugly real fast. That is absolutely true. Austin's going to go ahead and sacrifice his Evolving Wilds. And I'm a little surprised that Tom's taking things so slow because he does have to worry about that Westvale Abbey. I wonder if, it, if he's taking things so slow because he has another answer for an Ormondal. Yeah, I think he kind of just wants Austin to commit to this Ormondal. Yeah, Tom does have a second Stasis Snare in his sideboard that he might have brought in. We've seen one, we could see another. He also has the Declaration in Stones and I believe a Silk Wrap, all of which can hit Ormondal. The other thing, too, is it is nice for Tom to just preserve his creature count because of the fact that Thou's Lieutenant and uh, Always, watching. Always Watching are so much better the more creatures you have on the board. Well, it looks like Austin has picked up a copy of Sylvan Advocate here. It'll be interesting and this is a to pretty see. big roadblock. It'll be interesting to see if he just goes in on this Ormondal now or not. Yeah. And if Tom is able to blow him out with uh, a removal spell, that would be huge. Austin looks like he's taking it a little bit more patiently, a little bit more safely, and this Lumbering Falls is a, a very big threat. This essentially presents a two-turn clock, because with that Sylvan Advocate in play, that Lumbering Falls is a 5-5. Five five. Be interesting to see here if Tom decides to use his uh, Stasis Snare to take care of that Sylvan Advocate. That way he can ambush this Lumbering Falls. He might also just chump the Lumbering Falls and then use the Silk Wrap that's in his hand on the Sylvan Advocate. Austin's been playing this game very well. Tom has just been playing a little scared. Yeah, Tom's been playing passively. I really think it's because of those Eldrazi Sky Spawner attacks that Tom just thought at Austin had a good hand because that was a pretty bold attack. Uh, it looks like Austin is going to get in for the full seven going to drop Tom down to seven. 
I think another thing that Tom maybe has been playing to is a turn where, since he has so many lands, if he can cast two removal spells and a Thalys Lieutenant, that would be one big turn, and he could get a lot of damage in and catch Austin a little unawares. So he's going to go ahead and silk wrap the Sylvan Advocate. He might Declaration and Stone those human tokens here and get in some damage. I have to think he at least attacks with the Night or White Orchid, because the Thraben Inspectors still block the one ones on the ground. And if he wants to preserve his creature count, wow, so this is pretty big. So he's going to go ahead and get rid of that the human tokens. He's going to crash in with the Knight of the White Orchid and the Thraben Inspector for three. Going to bring Austin down to eight. So Tom feeling like he had to make a move, has made his move, and now we'll see where things go from here. He's definitely looking for something like Thalia's Lieutenant or uh, Always Watching. Austin is absolutely looking for a collective company. Man, and Austin is still plugging with that Eldrazi Skyspawn. That is bold. Actually, even though Austin didn't have collected company and was repping it, he did have the mana to activate that Lumbering Falls as a 3-3, three, three, and that, yeah. could, that could block any of Tom's attackers. Yeah. So that's likely why he was holding back. Yeah. It kind of hides there in those lands. Yeah, until he attacked with it, I had completely missed it. <laughs> Matter Reshaper is going to come down for Austin. Let's see what Tom has to answer this. I'm sure there's some guy throwing his soda at the screen while I'm talking about how Tom's given him all this respect and playing slow. That's why he's the boss. Yep, and I'm just the boss. <laughs> maybe, maybe one day I'll, I'll, I'll upgrade yep. to a fourth letter in my yeah, name. Yeah, get that second S. Yeah. Ooh, is that a Griff Spoon? That's what it looks like. Griff Spoon's pretty nice. All right, Griff Spoon is going to go on that Knight of the White Orchid. Grispoon is such a great card. Having access to some sort of repeatable source of flying, I mean, I've done this before with the Johnny Call of the Pride, and it is, it is just a great tool to have in your deck. Well, Grispoon is going to jump that Knight of the White Orchid in the air. It's going to let him attack for three, bringing Austin down to five. There's a... Uh, Westvale Abbey is going to bring Austin down to four. He's going to make a human. If Austin is able to play a cheap creature here and try and turn on this Ormondal to end this game, and Tom can snag it with a stasis there, that might be real disgusting. And if neither of these players draws a removal spell, this game is likely to end in the next couple turns. Both of them have uh, a pretty good attacking force and with those flyers, but not quite as good of a blocking force. Tom can put on the brakes a little better than Austin can, but Tom is usually going to be the one who wants to attack. These situations where you've got a kind of complicated board state and you're both so low on life can be some of the most stressful situations for players. Yeah. I know I've been in this kind of situation a lot, and it's just... There's nothing worse than it. You just got to take some deep breaths and try to think everything through, but it's really hard. I think that what we might see here is Austin just firing up his Lumbering Falls and attacking with the Sky Spawner, the Lumbering Falls, and the Matter Reshaper. Yeah, that would be a good attack because it would force Tom to block both the Matter Reshaper and the Lumbering Falls. And if that happens, Austin may get a redraw off that uh, Matter Reshaper, which could proved to be quite useful. Looks like he's going to play conservative and only attack with the Matter Reshaper. So it's a little tricky about this, is this means that uh, Austin isn't going to have a good blocker for that Knight of the White Orchid, and Tom looking to deny Austin a card, but also not wanting to take the, the damage, just throws that Thraben Inspector under the bus. So Tom's going to untap. He's going to draw for the turn. So 
even if Tom doesn't have anything as the board stands, uh, he's basically dead to another Westvale Abbey token entering the board and Austin firing off that Lumbering Falls and attacking with everything. So if Tom has nothing here and Austin goes for it, he, he could have an onboard kill. Oh no, can't activate Westvale Abbey when you're at one. Correct. So this is a great attack from Tom because it means even if he doesn't have anything, he gets some damage in and Austin doesn't have the onboard kill. So Austin is just going to take the damage. Now here, if he activates the Lumbering Falls, oh, he's just going to Declaration in Stone on the Sky Spawner. It's going to give Austin a clue. It's going to get a, a draw. Let's and a Reality Smasher off the top would be real nice. Or Collected Company, or yeah. a lot of live yeah. cards. Elvish oh. Visionary. <laughs> It's a redraw. What? Let's get another redraw. Man, this is down to the wire. Got to sweat every draw step. Perfectly navigated by both players. Yes. Elvish Visionary coming here for Austin Matthews. He has to be careful that he can't use any of his pain lands for mana, for colored mana. The clock is ticking down. Oh, oh, that is huge. Oh, no. So Vision Visionary is going to draw into an Eldrazi Displacer. And he can play the Eldrazi Displacer, and he can activate it. Keeping that Knight of the White Archive he, he, down. And he can actually activate it twice because of that Eldrazi Scion. Oh, that is huge. So he doesn't have a kill here, but he can certainly... Uh, lock down that Knight of the White Orchid and make it so that Tom doesn't have access to a flying attacker. Wow. So if Tom can draw a removal spell for this Eldrazi Displacer, he needs to do it on this following draw stuff and he can still win the game. By killing the Eldrazi Displacer and then reusing the Griff Spoon. Right. Wow, what a top deck. These players are interns. Austin is at one life. He's got his top eight life on the line. And here he is just ripping through the top of his deck, barely finds what he needs at the last moment. And now this is anybody's game. I think Tom just has to take this three points of damage and hope to draw a removal spell. So he's going to give him another redraw. And now he doesn't have to sacrifice the Eldrazi Scion well, to activate this Displacer twice. Not only that, but now if Tom even draws a removal spell, the Displacer can just tap down both of Tom's creatures, and he yes. won't be able to attack this turn. And it looks like he did just draw a Silk Wrap. Oh, man. Oh, no, it was an Anointer of Champions. Oh, I hate seeing Tom lose. Displacer is going to target this. It's going to die. He'll get a planes. Tom will get a land as a small consolation prize, but it's likely that Austin is just going to be untapping and attacking with everything for the win. Before he does so, he'll may blink that uh, Thraven Inspector, but it may also say, eh, I don't want you to have another clue. I don't care about that one, too. He also can blink his, blink his visionary to draw cards if he wants to. Oh, he can, world is his oyster. There's a lot of things he can do. All right, well, he's got to blink the, the anointer of champions. And likely we are going to see blink your, blo your last blocker, maybe activate my lumbering falls if I feel like it, attack with everything, and this game is all but over. Hopefully wow. Tom Ross still has the ability to top eight, but I think he's going to draw one card, see the top card of his library, and then give the hand, and that is game. Tom Man. Ross loses in a nail biter. Austin barely pulls it out with some like final top decks. That last card that he drew was all that mattered. Man, it wasn't even just like the last card. He elvish visionaried into the Eldrazi Displacer. Before that, he had to crack a clue. 
And he cracked a clue. Just sweating each draw step. It's like, miss, Austin. miss, miss. Finally, I get a hit. Austin Matthews on bat right is going to take this match 2-1 to one over Tom Ross on White Red Humans. Austin's going to move to 11-2. and two. Tom's going to fall to 10-3. and three. I believe that Tom is still going to be live for the top eight. But we will go ahead and find out that once we start looking at the actual standings moving forward. Yeah. And we've got one round left before our cuts to top eight, and things are already heating Two up. Two rounds.